you created a short film called The Alchemist Letter, and that was narrated by John Hurt, right? Given that, like, what inspired the, the story for it? And can you talk a little bit about the, the process behind it? I had done my short film in college and back in Portland and that had done very well. And then I hadn't, I was think I wanted to do another one and I hadn't started writing one. Um, and I was talking to that, to that creative director, David Viao, and he was actually the first one that we were just kicking around some ideas. And he's like, he's like, you know, what's really fascinating. Alchemy is fascinating. And the guy speaks in this very like passionate <laughs> tone. So I was like, you're right. Alchemy is really interesting. And then he just walked away, which is what he would do all the time. <laughs> This is interesting, and then he would he would book it into another room. It resonated with me because my my family um, is involved in a, in, a, in an alchemy of sorts. My father is a, a PhD um, psychotherapist mm -hmm. who's practiced shamanism for many many years, and so I've always kind of been in and around ideas of shamanism, and you know, shamanism is rooted in in ancient, ancient practice, you know, that dates back thousands of years. The story is not in any way reflective of my relationship with my father, because <laughs> I think some people might, might, uh, might, might believe that there's some truth or nugget to that buried in there, but it's not. Actually, my, my father has been phenomenal, you know, phenomenally committed and, and, uh, um, an available dad to me and guide my entire life. So it's sort of the opposite, you know, I, I didn't have kids when I wrote it, but I always knew that I wanted to. And I was so, I've always been so committed to my work and my craft that uh, I've, there was this little thing in the back of my mind that always questioned whether or not I was going to be as good of a father as my own dad was, or if I was going to, if I was going to be absentee, or if I was going to somehow, if I was going to somehow pay more attention to my work than to my own child. And so I, I really channeled the, that fear that I had deep down in a story about this idea of uh, the currency of life. And of course, in that film, the currency of life being being memory rather than gold, you know, time rather than than monetary value, mm -hmm. uh, things like that. So that's that's where it came from. Uh, but it also was just such a rich landscape to play in. I was like, this is one, I, I've always loved magic, you know, as long as magic is done correctly and it's not confusing or whatever. <laughs> I love, you know, I'm a huge, huge Disney fan. I always have been. For sure both coming up with the concept, but all the way through to completion, like what were the typical hurdles you need to go through, especially in the beginning? Look, for anybody trying to make a short film without finance, it's it's a it's a long uphill battle. You know, I started, obviously I started writing it and my first several drafts of it were very rough. Uh, it, 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 it really took shape over time, but I was in New York when I started writing it and I was working at Logan uh, and I just, I didn't have, it, Logan wasn't really an animated, an animation house. You know, they were mostly live action design. Uh, they did like title sequences for for films. They did the title sequence for Zombie Land uh, back in the day. They did some they did some work on Avengers, I think, at some point. Anyway, I was in New York. Logan wasn't really a, a place that I could approach to to do the production on it. And nor did I think they really had any reason or desire to spend money on something that they didn't think represented their company in the, mm -hmm. you know for their style so i was it was just me i was just sort of left to my own devices um and i had some friends in new york that would help me out when they had some free time every now and then doing some character design or um or doing a little bit of modeling or some free biz because i worked with a ton of freelancers in the area you know they were always coming in and out of the studio uh and so i sort of compiled this this let's call it a a pitch package <laughs> if you will mm -hmm. it was my it was my script. It was a handful of designs. It was some previs that I had edited together in a cut with some music. Um, it was all quite rough, but I'd had some. I had some character design done. I had a couple of character models done, and I just sort of like piecemealed all this stuff together. And I remember, I remember distinctly. I remember this moment. I had this conversation with my mom actually, and I was I was back I think at home visiting for Christmas, and I was like, I just I was like I've been working on this thing for like two years now. And I have nothing to show for it. You know, I have no way of getting this thing made. I don't have a, a dime to make it, you know. And of course, being in the commercial industry, I knew how much this shit cost. <laughs> I was like, there's no way I can afford to pay these freelance artists on their day rates, which are, are you know, deserved, but high. And and uh, and hope that I could possibly make this short film. She's like, you got to stop worrying about how you're going to make it. You'll drive yourself crazy if you are, are constantly thinking about how you're gonna make it because it doesn't seem like there's any solution to it. She's like, you just just believe that you're gonna make it. That's it. Just put your energy into, into changing your mind to thinking that you're gonna make it, knowing that you're gonna make it. 
And so I started doing that. And, you know, whether that's the reason why or not is, is left up to the universe, I suppose. But um, I got a call from Leica, who was looking to bring a director in to their, uh, into Leica House, which is their, their um, was their short form content division that did a lot of commercial work and M&M's campaigns. And they did a bunch of title sequences for the films also. It was the old Will Vinton Studios. I'm sure we can talk about that more later. Mm -hmm. But they, you know, they wanted me to come out badly enough that uh, that I showed them my materials, and they they actually wrote it into my contract that they would help me, that they would help me get it done. That's great. And they were looking for it was just serendipity because at the time they were looking for uh, animated ideas. They they had I think they had some grants through the state and some other things like that through the Oregon Film Board that would help them make stuff like this to showcase the talent of the 3D artists that were working at the studio and to be a portfolio piece and stuff. And they they had this like short film program. They did another one, um, I think it was tile, titled the, the Tale of Momentum and Inertia. It was a really phenomenal like one minute short film, like about, about the shortest short film you could possibly make. And it's brilliant. I mean, it's, it's really funny and, and great. Um, and so I was sort of the next one in that pipeline. But the story doesn't end there because I got to Portland. I started working at Leica. It was a great experience. I loved it. You know, there was, we I got, had access to all the stages and everything. And I really got to learn stop motion, um, working with an amazing art department. And we started working on Alchemist. We got a, we got a decent way through. We got through most of the, the visual production of, of, of uh, producing the shots. And then Travis Knight, who is the CEO of Leica. So Leica House had been around ever since they transitioned Will Benton Studios into Leica Entertainment. And he kept Leica House because he had been an intern there once and it was a, a fixture in the community. But I think at that point, he really wanted to focus on entertainment. And so um, he didn't have the energy to keep Leica House as part of the Leica family anymore. Or it didn't make sense to him um, in ways that I'm, I, I'm probably don't even know the reasons for it, so I won't even try. Ultimately, the the executive producers and the creative directors at Leica House ended up, um, I, I wanna say buying it from Leica and spinning it off into something that's now known as House Special. So in the middle of all that, I was caught sort of in the crosshairs because I had a contract with Leica while this thing was getting spun off into this other entity. And my they were not contractually obligated to finish my short film, but Leica was, but the but the the production facility didn't exist under Leica's banner anymore. So I was like, so anyway, I got I got stuck in this really strange position where I ultimately I, I went and had a meeting with Travis and you know he we worked out a deal where I got to keep um the film in its entirety and I got the rights to it back because wow. Leica had owned the rights, you know. So I got I got the rights to the film back in exchange for some contractual stuff. And ultimately I got to finish it on my own. So now I was in a position where I had to figure out how to get the rest done. I didn't have any voice acting. I didn't have any music. I didn't have any sound design. Uh, and I didn't have, there were still a, a variety, a handful of shots that hadn't been finished. So um, I took on the responsibility of, of finishing the shots that had to be finished myself, just comp comping and, and doing everything else I possibly could to get them done. Uh, and then I did a Kickstarter for, to get the funds to pay for voice talent. Um, and that, I think we raised like $15,000 and mm -hmm. it's a fun little part of the story. So at the time I have agents now, which are you know invaluable in getting me, in connecting me with other people and getting me in, into doors that I wouldn't otherwise be able to get into. But um, at the time I didn't have any agents and I didn't know any actors. <laughs> I didn't have any way of getting in touch with any actors. And I, I took a trip down to, uh, to Puerto Vallarta, Mexico, uh, because my parents had a friend down there and I remember going down there and I brought the finished picture with me and I, I showed it to him and he was like, oh, this is fantastic. He's like, my, my, you know, my brother lives in London and his wife is an agent at, uh, at one of the big, big, biggest agencies out there. Um, and she's got a bunch of, cause I, at the time I was really thinking about like Patrick Stewart or Ian McKellen or something like that for the voice. Mm -hmm. And um, it was pie in the sky's idea. And, and he was like, oh, I'll put you in contact with my brother. And so, he just shot an email off and I sent a link and I got a call back from uh, from his wife and who, who was friends with the agent of John Hurt. And she said, hey, send me the send me the film. I'll show it to John. And it's great. Sure enough, she did. And he was like, yeah, I'll do it. So I flew out to London and recorded him. And wow. that's all that happened. <laughs> a lot that's of serendipity awesome. needed to happen in order for that thing to get done. 